S S S S K vibe maker. And today yeah. in the virtual room, we have one of the finest rappers of the generation, Detroit's finest. Big Sean's in the virtual room with me. What's what's going on, man? S K, what up, though? What's up, bro? I'm feeling great. Happy to be here. How you feeling, man? I'm feeling good, man. I gotta say from the top, congratulations on Detroit too. Such a fine piece of work, man. I feel like you're an artist, unlike many that are in the ascendancy. You know, when artists usually get to like album number five, they're kind of like sort of tailing off. But you're mm -hmm. definitely, you're definitely powering up more, man. Thank you so much, bro. That means a lot. Um, it's definitely an album that, you know, I worked very hard on and uh you know i put my i just put my honesty out there i like you know sacrifice my privacy and just at the same time also have fun with it too you know so I'm, i appreciate you saying that man mm -hmm. for real and unusual times like 2000 well this year you know what i'm saying the last you know few months man 2020 been very unusual for a lot of people the pandemic covid19 mm -hmm. running right around the world how was it for you making an album under these circumstances you know it wasn't it wasn't challenging when I just surrendered to God and what was going on in the in the universe and just like surrendered to like stop trying to control uh divine timing for me, you know, cuz I always like I always pray on divine timing and like meditate and like I always am like you know, I want everything to work out for me at the right time and I always ask for that, but then at the same time, you know, I was trying to put my album out before the pandemic, but it just wasn't feeling all the way there to me. So I made sure I took that extra time. And then when everything started happening, it was like I had to like hold up even more because I had to experience life and adjust my life so much and go through these crazy tragedies, these crazy times you know, that we all were going through in some ways. And it was just, it was definitely an experience that I'll never forget. And it definitely helped um, fine tune the music, you know, and the finishing touches of it. So it was, it was an experience and it was something I'm thankful for, but at the same time, you know, it's just, it's terrible that the world has to go through this, that we can't tour, see each other face to face for real. And you know, all those things. So it's, it's a lot of pros and a lot of cons, you know, a lot of ups and downs. Boy, yeah. remember we used to do that all the time. Boy. Boy. <laughs> yeah, I still do it on occasions, on occasions, you know. Straight up. Yeah. So deep reference with Nipsey Hussle, one of his last verses that he recorded before he passed away. Um, when you was making that track, man, what was the mood in the studio like? Did you know that you had one? I mean, the mood in the studio was, you know, at first it was just like, you know, I've known Nipsey since like 2008. So at first it was just us, you know, collabing and talking. And then when he passed away, um, it was just a more of a tribute to him, you know, to finish that and to get that out to the world. And his family was fully supportive. His people's, you know, his All Money In crew. Um, and so I appreciate that support from them. But it was definitely a... It was a bittersweet thing because I could still feel the essence of him and, you know, his presence, especially on that song. But it's just, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it sucks that he's not here to like, you know, to, to shoot a video with me or to, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. talk about the song or, mm -hmm. you know, but so it's, it's, it's definitely a bittersweet thing. Mama say it takes one time to F up your whole Wikipedia is a line that very much stuck out for me on the track. We are very much in the middle, the midst of cancel culture. What was the main inspiration behind that line, man? The main inspiration was just my mom telling me that. That was... <laughs> yeah, she was really awesome. said that. Absolutely. She was like, <laughs> oh, you got to be careful who you, you know deal with who you're moving around with all it takes is one thing and it's on your wikipedia forever you know so i just all the all the stuff that i like on this album or even that i rap about is just things that i really go through or things i'm trying to manifest you know mm -hmm. i never really lied in my raps that's why i don't be rapping about like on this album i don't rap about bricks and no shit like that because it's just like i was just rapping from a perspective you know mm -hmm. so that's it's it's all real. All them type of lines are really real. Shouts to mums who's definitely down with the technology, man. You know what I'm saying? Using the Wikipedia and that. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
And you know what? Big shout out to Dave Chappelle, who done a nice skit on the album, talking mm. about Detroit and his experiences. And I know you had another line on the album where you said that you're kind of conflicted repping a city that you no longer stay in. Um, but the part in Detroit that you grew up in, um, how would you, you know, explain that and give a short tour guide to anyone who hasn't been there? Detroit is a beautiful city. Um, it's still my home. And, you know, when I came up with that line, I was just coming from the perspective of like, I'm always, I was always gone. It seems like for the past 10 years, even like, I, you know, I have a house there, but I just never like am hardly there because I'm just always moving and performing and working mm -hmm. other places. But I feel like I spend enough time there that lasts a lifetime anyway, because because it's just like the vibe, the 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 essence, the energy of the city is unmatched. You know, it, Detroit has like such a soulful connection. You know, I feel like Motown music gave black people an identity in music. You know, mm -hmm. there was no face for black people before Motown and the automobile. You know, Detroit made the first paved street ever. And, you know, the first mall ever built was in Detroit. So it's just like all these ups and downs. And it's the first city to go bankrupt. In a, mm -hmm. in a country so all these ups and downs just like you know they are a testament to our resilience and that's the people from detroit are just built different you know and i'm sure like every city everyone is built different but detroit especially because we just people have been through so much they're not bougie they're real they're authentic and they have deep roots you know mm -hmm. um so for me growing up in detroit dog it was just like i seen some of the craziest ever I seen people be, I saw one time somebody being lit on fire and dragged down the street on a car, you know, like right, I couldn't believe it. And I seen, I seen a lot of just crazy things, but I seen a lot of beauty as well. Mm -hmm. So it was just, a, it was a city that it was unpredictable and, you know, dangerous and sometimes beautiful. Um, but it was a city that made me who I am. Big Sean's in the building. How about that? Interview number four. Number four. Four wow. conversations, man. Damn. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, man. I'm glad you're here, man. Yeah, so I'm Lithuania, your your latest collaboration with Travis Scott. When I go back to 2014, I think about Don't Play and I think about 10 to 10. <laughs> and I think about the great collaborations that you lot have, have had over the years, man. You definitely got that synergy. How did the relationship begin with you and Travis Scott, man? I think working on during during Cruel Summer is when I met him. Um during some of those sessions and I didn't know he I didn't even know he was an artist at the time like he was just so low-key and just so into the music like I just thought he was a producer and then I heard him and I was like oh he's he's like he's fired you know so mm -hmm. or at least I saw the potential I wouldn't say he was fired in but I did mm -hmm. see the potential mm -hmm. and then I could just you could just tell from then he just started going and going and then I remember that um that first tape he dropped, it was like, oh, this is hard. And Before then, the rodeo? No. Was it Al, Al Faro? Yeah, Al Faro. And then, obviously, by the time he got the days before rodeo, that's the point where it started to be um, pretty undeniable that he was uh, in his own lane and making his own waves, you know? And then uh, with his first album, I feel like he was like, he solidified his spot. Second album got even bigger, and then third album it was mm. unstoppable Absolutely. at that point. So for sure. you know, I'm so happy for my brother, and you know, we made Lithuania. He just pulled up to the crib, and we just made it right, right on spot. It was mm. fun. Keeping it on collabo talk, um, something that I've been speaking to a lot of artists recently is about the situation when you have a guest feature on one of your songs, and you personally feel like. The guest feature maybe overshadowed you. Now you're uh -huh. someone who's very sharp with your pen, Big Sean. I don't know if mm -hmm. you've ever felt like you've been overshadowed by a guest feature, but how do you deal with it, man? Do you just still put it out? Do you do you shelve the track? Do you rewrite <laughs> your verse? How have you dealt with that scenario if you've ever dealt with it? I don't think I look at it from that perspective. I just look at it as if if I like the song or not. I kind of look at it from a production standpoint and a um value of the song as opposed to just like my part so i kind of take my ego out of it 
when it comes to the consumer or the listener. You know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. I do my thing, and if somebody comes on there and does their thing, then that's that's fire. You know, that mm-hmm. I feel like it's um, it's always on the listener. It's like what's what's best for the listener as opposed to what's best for me when it comes to making the music, because the music is for the people. You know. Mm-hmm. For the people, it's to give them a feeling, it's to give them like an experience. So that's kind of what I always look at. I don't ever like if I ever have to edit something or change something. It's never based off just because of me. It's always based off of like, oh, this is gonna make it a better song. Pop Smoke was definitely quite responsible for championing the UK drill sound. Um, the UK drill mm-hmm. thing is popping off. It's like an amalgamation of like what started in Chicago, the UK putting their own spin on it. And a lot of significant UK drill producers have been working with American artists. I wanted to ask you if you're very much aware of the UK drill movement or you've heard any of it. Oh yeah, for sure. I'm very, very, very aware of it. And like, I've never taken a crack at drill music yet myself, like properly, you know, I mean, I have probably like way back a different version of it, but yeah, it sounds so hard though. Now, yeah. off the album Detroit 2, which is out now, Lucky Me, one of the first tracks. I think it's the first track on the album, isn't it? The first track on the album, I, Lucky Me? It was going to be the first track. That's a funny thing you said that. The first track on there is called Why Would I Stop? Of course. And uh, that was made, Why Would I Stop was made the last second that the album was turned in, like, and he just slipped it right in there as the intro track. Yeah, it almost didn't make it, and I was like, "Damn, I don't, I don't even know if I should put it on there because it was so last second. But Hit Boy was like, "Bro, you just gotta trust me. Just this is a fire intro, like mm-hmm. you know, assess the tone." So, but Lucky Me you, you was the intro before, so. And one of the revelations on the album, which you said on Lucky Me, is about the heart disease. No one ever knew that before. You definitely put the revelation out there about you suffering with that and right. um, getting treated by a holistic doctor when you was 19 or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. And you getting better from that. I mean, what's your yeah. sort of feelings towards Western medicine now? Do you still mess with the mes- Western medicine or are you dealing with the holistic doctors all the time now? I definitely have a holistic doctor. I have a Western medicine doctor too because, you know, I just feel like I do holistic as much as I can. Like I eat right. I have a lot of supplements, you know, that I take, a lot of vitamins. And I still take magnesium to this day. I mean... I take it every night before I go to bed still. So um, it helps out a lot. And that's like magnesium is the natural way to put your body back on its like rhythm and the blood to flow right. So my heartbeat was just completely off. And they told me that they had to put a pacemaker in it and for it to beat right and or cut it half open and scar the top of my heart so the electric currents could run through the scars. It was like a deep thing, but you know that that definitely made me a believer you know in uh in holistic medicine and doing things naturally so that's just how i move you know and everything's kosher now everything's okay oh everything's great Mm -hmm. yeah i have like a very healthy healthy heart now so i've also been working taking the time to work out you we've know. seen that on your Instagram. I'm not saying I'm looking at that like as a man and that, but we see right. you working out and we see you promoting that, man. Yeah, it's something yeah, to be sure. proud of, man. That's the testament of hard work. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, something that I uh, take seriously. You know, I feel like when I had that a uh, couple of years ago when I was just going through a, a real rough patch in my life, I, I just had to make some adjustments, you know, and I had always started to work out and fell off of it, but I just stayed on it this time and it paid off, you know? I'm going to ask you something that a lot of people are asking you, but I need to ask you as well, because I feel like you need to be peppered with this question so this becomes a reality. We need a sequel to the 2088 album. Are we going to get that, Big Sean? I think so. I mean, I don't see why not. We haven't made it yet, though, so, you know, we just got to catch those right vibes, but, you know, all is well between me and her and... She's she's pretty creative. I'm pretty creative right now, so we just gotta get it in. We gotta we gotta find the time, but you know, one of the things me and her were talking about is just taking some time to just like relax a little bit too and then get into it. Mm-hmm. So hopefully soon. You everybody's favorites, man. You know that. You guys are everybody's favorites. Uh, <laughs> 
Raised by the Wolves with Post Malone is an absolute anthemic song, man. And we're glad that this is going to be a single. This is the next single. The next mm. visual is coming out. Um, how is it working with Post Malone? Post Malone is the best, man. He is like such a cool guy. He is just so like authentic in his world. The coolest, man. The most polite, mm -hmm. easy to work with. I mean, he deserves everything he has, man. He is just like all the respect to him. He's he's the man. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so I appreciate him. I love him for what he did, you know, mm -hmm. to Wolves and how much respect he has for me. Mm -hmm. You know, and I got just as much respect for him back. So mm -hmm. I appreciate him, man. It was great. It was, the, the video's awesome. I can't wait to put it out. Mm -hmm. We had a real Wolves on set, like, I had never been with a real wolf. Like, I'm thinking that it's like, you know, like a husky type of dog. Like, wolves aren't dogs, by the way. They're wolves. Mm -hmm. I, I got very, I got corrected on set when the guy who was like the wolf tamer was like, oh, this is not a dog. This is a wolf. Mm -hmm. He was, he was as big as me and the guy. Like, mm -hmm. and they move differently, you know? Like, they're related to dogs in some way, I'm sure, but they are not dogs, man. They are like a whole different thing. And um, I had to feed it all this raw meat, you know, for it not to attack me, I guess, mm -hmm. or like for it to like stay calm. Mm -hmm. And it was just a crazy, crazy time. But the video is fun, man. I can't wait for people to see it. Mad respect, Big Sean, because not only are you a dope MC, but you're very humble. And I appreciate you spending the time to speak to me media personalities like myself, because you've got a lot of these artists nowadays who are moving mad sexy and don't want to do interviews. So we appreciate you, Big Sean. We appreciate you, man. Nah, of course. SK, I appreciate you, man. Keep up the great work. Keep up the, you know, it's not a lot of people that actually care about artists and the music like that, you know what I'm saying? Deep enough to, to research or to ask questions properly, you know, and you know, I can just tell that you really, really are doing it out of passion. So I appreciate you, dog. Mm -hmm. and keep up the great work, man. And you know, I'm gonna see you soon for sure. S S S S K vibe maker.